In this module, we're going to spend more time talking about sleep than any other state of consciousness. Sleep is a very important part of our life. Let's face it, you spend about one third of your life asleep. And when you're asleep, your brain is not inactive. You're not unconscious. Patterns of activity are different when you're asleep than when you're awake. So we think of sleep as an altered state of consciousness rather than a lack of consciousness or a state of unconsciousness. So how do researchers go about measuring sleep? The standard tool for measuring the stages of sleep is something known as an electroencephalogram, usually referred to as an EEG for short. This is an instrument by which we can measure the electrical activity of the brain and study stages of sleep by looking at the pattern of brain waves that we're seeing at any given time. Back in the old days, when I was in graduate school, um, when you measured EEG, you had to put paste all over a person's head and try to get electrodes to stick to it. And it took forever to get stuff out of your hair and the connections weren't very good. So the technology was not terribly reliable. But now they've got these slick caps that you can slip on. Uh, you can see them in the pictures on this slide. And the electrodes are already in position on the cap and exactly where you want them to be on the person's skull for measuring the brain activity. So this is the tool that we're going to be using to look at the different stages of sleep. The output of an EEG is in the pattern of uh, waves. These waves reflect the electrical activity of the brain and you can watch them march across the computer screen while the person is sleeping or if you have the instruments uh, arranged properly you have a recording pen that will sketch out the record of the brain activity on paper. Either way this is what it looks like and when we describe brain waves we're usually talking about the same things that you can use to describe any other kind of waves and we're going to emphasize the importance of frequency and amplitude. Frequency just refers to how many waves come and go within a given period of time. So for example, if you have a uh, hundred different waves that cycle through in 10 seconds, those are higher frequency waves than waves, uh, than a situation where you might only have 10 waves cycling through in a, a space of 10 seconds. Amplitude refers to the height of the wave. How big is it? How much distance is there between the peak and the valley of the wave? So we're going to be talking about waves in terms of their frequency and amplitude. Let's start by talking about what a person's brain waves look like when they're awake. The top two lines in the uh, slide that you see here indicate what brain activity looks like in a person who's awake. And there are two kinds of waves that you see in here, alpha waves and beta waves. Alpha waves are what you see when a person is relaxed, awake, but not intently focusing on anything. So when you're trying to get people to relax and get rid of stress, you sometimes train them with biofeedback techniques to generate alpha waves. So if you're just kind of relaxed, looking out the window at the nice day, uh, daydreaming a little bit, if I were to record your brain activity then, I would see alpha waves. Alpha waves are kind of bumpy looking. They're a little lower in frequency than beta waves and a little higher in amplitude. On the other hand, if I were to measure your brain activity when you're taking one of the quizzes for this class, I should see a constant pattern of beta activity. Uh, now you've got very high frequency waves, very low amplitude. It's very tight. It almost looks like a straight line. This is what the brain waves look like for a person who is awake and focused uh, intensely on something. They're not relaxed. When a person starts falling asleep, the first place they go is into stage one sleep. This is when you start feeling drowsy and you're kind of drifting off. It lasts anywhere from one to seven minutes. And this is the stage of sleep that I see in students in my classes. Uh, they start off getting a little glassy eyed and then their eyes close and you can see their head drooping a little bit. And uh, these people are in stage one sleep. They're still aware that they're in the classroom. They can hear the sound of my voice, but they're starting to drift off into their own reality. 
a person in stage one sleep is very easy to wake up. Uh, a sharp noise or uh, any other unusual stimulus will bring them right back. The brain waves in stage one sleep look a lot like alpha waves, but you get these little bursts of what are called theta waves that are slightly higher in amplitude uh, and lower in frequency. And that's an indication that the person is no longer just awakened, relaxed, but they're starting to drift into sleep. In stage two sleep, uh, you see the waves becoming even higher in amplitude and lower in frequency. And you start to see the uh, something called sleep spindles show up. If you look at the diagrams here, you see these bursts of high frequency waves that come and go, and that's called a sleep spindle. We don't really know what sleep spindles are all about, although one interesting factoid is that the frequency of sleep spindles is highly correlated with IQ, so that people with high IQs have more frequent bursts of sleep spindles. Other than, we don't really know what that means, but it's something that's been established. A person in stage two sleep is much more asleep than a person in stage one sleep, but they're still easy to wake up. Stage two sleep is the stage of sleep where people who talk in their sleep uh, do their talking. If you've ever had a sibling or a roommate who talked in his or her sleep, you might have even been able to engage them in conversation. Uh, they'll answer you, but when they wake up, they don't have any recollection that that happened. After stage two sleep, we now have stage three sleep. You now begin to see uh, something called delta waves. They're very slow, high amplitude, low frequency waves. They make up about 20 to 50% of the record when a person's in stage three sleep. In stage three sleep, it's much harder to wake somebody up than in stage one or two sleep. Blood pressure, body temperature, muscle tone, heart rate, all of those things are decreasing. The person's breathing becomes deeper and more even. So the person in stage three sleep is pretty hard to wake up. This is a stage of sleep where you uh, will sometimes see sleep walking or night terrors, uh, where people wake up screaming in the state of panic terror. Oh, we sometimes think that the person has had a bad dream, but it doesn't seem that this is really about dreaming at all. It's just this uh, physiological thing that happens with a very strong emotional component to it. It's much more common in children than in adults. After stage three sleep, we have something called stage four sleep. Stage four sleep is sometimes called deep sleep. This, uh, the brainwave record is almost continuous delta waves, so it's nothing but these high, slow, low frequency waves. Uh, the person in stage four sleep is really hard to wake up. They're very deeply asleep. They seldom move. Uh, you spend about 15% of the night in stage four sleep. And if you're deprived of it, uh, we'll make up for it on later nights. So if you don't get enough stage four sleep, the following night you'll get a little more stage four sleep than you ordinarily would. You sometimes see sleepwalking and night terrors in stage four sleep as well. These first four stages of sleep collectively are referred to as slow wave sleep. They're sometimes called non-REM sleep. Uh, they take up about 75 to 80% of the night's sleep. And so therefore, most of the time uh, while you're sleeping, you're engaged in one of those stages. The final stage of sleep that I'd like to talk about is REM sleep. I'm sure almost all of you know that REM stands for rapid eye movements because that's one of the ways you can tell that somebody is in REM sleep. If you look at their eyelids while they're sleeping, you'll see their eyeballs darting around behind the eyelids. And it's not just uh, humans. All mammals have REM sleep. Uh, so if you have a dog, you can watch the dog's eyes and see the dog in REM sleep. And presumably they're having dog dreams just like we have uh, human dreams because it's during REM sleep when vivid dreaming occurs. REM sleep is sometimes called paradoxical sleep because even though you're very, very deeply asleep, the brain waves look very much like the beta waves you see in a person who's awake, alert, and highly focused. They're very high frequency, very low amplitude, and this brain wave pattern is quite different than you would expect from a person who's very deeply asleep. Some of the other things that happen here are uh, striking loss of muscle tone. 
So the if you were to pick up somebody's arm and flop it around, it's almost like there's no bones or muscles in there. Uh, people in REM sleep often have frequent muscle twitches. It's possible that REM sleep is essential for storing things in memory. One of the things that makes us think that that's the case is newborn babies spend about 70% of the night in REM sleep uh, because everything is new to them and they're learning a lot very quickly. By the time they're six months old, it's down to about 30% of the sleep record and it continues to decline throughout life. So by the time you get uh, to an old person like me, I probably spend about 15% of my night in REM sleep. REM sleep also shows a rebound effect. If you deprive people of REM sleep, they will get more REM sleep on subsequent nights as if they're trying to make up for the lost REM sleep that came earlier. Depriving people of REM sleep also makes them very irritable. So uh, REM sleep is the time during which dreaming occurs. And the dreams that you have in REM sleep are real, organized, well-integrated stories. They, they have a structure, they're easy to recall, they've got details, they've got a plot. There are things that happen in non-REM sleep that we might call dreams, but they're not like REM dreams at all. They're more like images or thoughts. They're not vivid, they're not very visual, they're not as weird, they're not as emotional. So the things that happen in non-REM sleep uh, really are not dreams in the same sense that REM dreams are. For more information about what psychologists think about the meaning of dreams, check out uh, the other set of slides on dreaming that go with this module of the class. So to summarize the stages of slow wave sleep, stage one, uh, this is when you're first drifting off to sleep, you're drowsy, um, the brain activity is almost all alpha waves. It's really easy to wake the person up. It only lasts a couple of minutes. Stage two sleep, the person is more soundly asleep, but you can still wake them up pretty easily. And you start to see sleep spindles in the sleep record. Stage three sleep, we start to see the appearance of delta waves, the very slow, high amplitude waves. Uh, people are now much harder to wake up. All of their normal waking physiological symptoms like blood pressure, body temperature start to go down. And in stage four sleep, also known as deep sleep, you have continuous delta wave activity and the person is extremely hard to wake up and they don't move around very much. And REM sleep is characterized by rapid eye movements, very vivid dreaming. dreaming. It is referred to as paradoxical sleep because the brain wave patterns look very much like beta waves, like a person who's alert and awake. And there's a complete loss of muscle tone in REM sleep. We go through a very predictable pattern of uh, sleep when we're sleeping on an average night. Now I recognize as college students, your uh, the times at which you sleep and the length of time you sleep may be quite different, but I'm gonna pretend you're normal people and we'll talk about a young adult who sleeps about eight hours and what the pattern will look like. Adults generally dream about every 90 minutes, but the dreaming tends to pile up late in the sleep cycle. So you're having dreams more often uh, in the early morning hours shortly before you wake up. And each REM episode you have lasts about 30 minutes. Most stage four sleep occurs pretty early in the uh, sleep period most REM sleep occurs later. So if you look at the graph there, you'll notice that you start being awake, you drift down through stage one, two, three, down to stage four sleep, and then you move back up, stage three, stage two, and then you have a brief burst of REM activity, then you go back down into stage three and four sleep for a while, then you bump back up, have another period of REM activity, back down to stages three and four, and it goes up and down throughout the night. And notice the black bars that represent REM sleep become more frequent and longer in duration uh, near the end of the sleep cycle. Now you can just see the tips of the graph below that. 
Uh, this would represent what an elderly person's sleep cycle looks like. And you'll notice that the REM periods are shorter. They don't take as much uh, up of the whole sleep cycle, and they're not stacked near the end quite as much as they are with younger people. So we go through a pretty regular cycle of stages while we're sleeping in a normal night.